I want to talk about the growing tensions between China and the United States. I want to talk about the tensions growing between these two nations over Taiwan specifically. I want to refresh everyone's memory. Uh, I, th I think everyone remembers this story. U.S. General's prediction of war with China in 2025 risks turning worse fears into reality. And this article says, I hope I'm wrong. Uh, and they're talking about uh, U.S. General Minahan, who heads the Air Force's Air Mobility Command. This was in uh, an internal memo he wrote, which was circulated on social media to the leadership of its 110,000 members. Chinese President Xi Jinping, he explains, secured his third term and set his war council in October 2022. Taiwan's presidential elections are in 2024 and will offer Xi a reason. United States' presidential elections are in 2024 and will offer Xi a distracted America. Xi's team, reason, and opportunity are all aligned uh, for 2025. Well, I don't buy that. That is uh, unconvincing. And I've explained this many times. It's not China that is rushing to go to war uh, with uh, the United States over Taiwan by 2025. It's the other way around. It's the United States eager for war with China by 2025. And the reason is very simple. Uh, over the years, the military and economic disparity between the United States and China has been narrowing. It is going to soon close. And then it's going to start widening up again, but this time in favor of China. And after 2025, and not 2025 exactly, but around that time, and, and afterwards, any hope of the United States conducting any kind of military operation against China in any way of, of being successful, that opportunity will be gone, gone forever. The United States will never be able to use its military uh, to coerce China in any way from 2025, around 2025 onward. Now, I'm refreshing everyone's memory about this because I want to talk about the, the conflict itself and wargaming that these U.S. governments and arms industry funded think tanks have been carrying out. And I want to show you one in particular, Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. The first battle of the next war, wargaming, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, and they show these old uh, antiquated U.S. main battle tanks that Taiwan uses, and they're just sitting on the beach in a very impractical way, pointed out at the sea, awaiting some sort of Normandy-style storming of the beaches uh, by the People's Liberation Army. This is how this paper about their war gaming starts out. What would happen if China attempted an amphibious invasion of Taiwan? CSIS developed the war game for a Chinese amphibious invasion of Taiwan and ran it 24 times. In most scenarios, the United States, Taiwan, Japan defeated a conventional amphibious invasion by China and maintained an autonomous Taiwan. However, this defense came at high cost. The United States and its allies lost dozens of ships. If you read the whole paper, they talk about several aircraft carriers being lost as well. Hundreds of aircraft and tens of thousands of service members. Taiwan saw its economy devastated. And in addition to that, again, if you read the entire paper, they talk about how if it looks like uh, mainland China is about to take over any critical infrastructure or get a hold of any critical semiconductor industry, the United States should use long-range missiles to destroy it. So in other words, Taiwan will be able to maintain its uh, autonomy, but it'll be at the cost of its physical existence. So political autonomy, it gets to keep that, but at the cost of giving up its physical existence. Uh, that do doesn't sound like victory to me. It also says further, the high losses damaged the U.S. global position for many years. China also lost heavily and failure to occupy Taiwan might destabilize Chinese Communist Party rule. There is no such thing as the Chinese Communist Party. It is the Communist Party of China, CPC. And for people who, who want to argue that point, it would be as ignorant as saying the states united America. It just It doesn't make any sense. And the only reason people call it the CCP is to just simply ignore what China calls it themselves so that they can 
uh, assert themselves over China in, in this very petty, immature way. The Chinese call it the Communist Party of China, and that is what I will call it. Victory is therefore not enough. The United States needs to strengthen deterrence immediately, and by that they mean buy more weapons. And I'm going to get into CSIS's uh, arms manufacturer sponsors here in, in just a moment as well. Uh, so the paper admits that there is no Ukraine model for Taiwan. Once any sort of armed conflict begins, there will be no way for the United States and its allies to ship any type of uh, weapons or ammunition or any other type of support to Taiwan. It's, just, it's an island and it's right off the coast of the rest of China. It's thousands and thousands of miles away from uh, the United States and its allies in Europe. So that, that's not going to happen. So they say everything that Taiwan needs to fight off an invasion needs to be uh, dumped into Taiwan right now. Flood Taiwan with weapons right now. That That is what they're saying. The paper also says in peacetime, the United States and Taiwan must work together to provide Taiwan with the weapons it needs. That's what I just said. And in wartime, if the United States decides to defend Taiwan, U.S. forces must quickly engage in direct combat. That means the United States, in order for the U.S. and Taiwan to win, the United States has to engage in direct warfare with China immediately. Because if they do not, if they even hesitate and then come in later, China is going to succeed in uh, landing on Taiwan and uh, reunifying Taiwan with the rest of China entirely through military force. We hear US policymakers talk like this. You can already see how late the hour is, how little disparity there still exists between China and the U United States economically and militarily. It seems almost as you read through this paper that the window may already have closed. Then the paper gets into the background, uh, the status of Taiwan. So let's, let's hear what CSIS has to say. Taiwan is widely regarded as the most dangerous potential flashpoint for conflict between the United States and China. And I, I just want people to look at a map and see where Taiwan is. And I want them to then ask themselves why this is any of the United States' business at all. It is uh, entirely on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. It is right off the coast of mainland China. How is this a potential flashpoint between the US and China? It just doesn't make any sense at all. It would be like if somehow Catalina Island off the coast of California was, was a flashpoint because China was crossing the entire Pacific to involve itself there. It says, in 1949, the nationalist government of China under the Kuoming, uh, Kuomintang Party, or KMT, established an autonomous government on the island after being pushed off the mainland. The Chinese Communist Party, I'm going to refer to it as the Communist Party of China, CPC, thus regards Taiwan as a breakaway province with no legitimate claim to autonomy or independence, recognizing Beijing as the sole legitimate government of China and severing diplomatic relations with Taipei as a precondition for any country to establish diplomatic relations with China. And virtually every country on earth has actually done that. They have completely severed diplom official diplomatic ties with Taipei. They recognize Beijing and the People's Republic of China there as the sole legitimate government of all of China, which includes Taiwan. That is the one China policy. And I just want to point out, and I, I do this in every video, but it needs to be done over and over again. The US State Department's own official website under US relations with Taiwan admits to all of this. The United States has a long-standing one China policy. And we do not support Taiwan independence. And so everything that the U.S. is therefore doing to encourage uh, Taiwan's independence, its autonomy, this flies in the face of the, their own agreement they made with Beijing and the People's Republic of China. It's very obvious who is provoking the, the conflict here over Taiwan. I've also showed this article many times, and it's very important for people to understand this. This is Voice of America, U.S government-funded media, U.S. nearly doubled military personnel stationed in Taiwan this year. This was from 2021. So the U.S. has troops on an island 
they officially recognize as part of China. And they, they do not recognize Taiwan's independence. And so they are blatantly trampling Chinese sovereignty here by doing this. Before they start talking about their own war game, they talk about other other people's war games. And these are things that you might want to look up and check into if you're deeply interested in this topic. The Department of Defense has done much internal war gaming on a US-China conflict, but the results are classified with only a few details leaking out. These details hint at heavy casualties and unfavorable outcomes. For example, in a widely cited commentary, uh, a, a senior RAN analyst noted, in our games, when we fight Russia and China, the United States gets its ass handed to it. Uh, a, a former Undersecretary of Defense for Policy similarly stated, the Pentagon's own war games reportedly show that current force plans would leave the military unable to deter and defeat Chinese aggression in the future. When they say Chinese aggression, they're talking about internal political affairs of China regarding Taiwan. That is what they're talking about. Another report noted that a secret war game showed that the United States could prevail in the conflict with China, but at the risk of causing nuclear escalation. And we could just look at what's going on in Ukraine right now, the US proxy war there, and how poorly the United States is doing uh, in Ukraine. And this, this is with their ability to flood Ukraine with weapons, and this is them not having to get involved directly. Uh, over Taiwan, they would have to get involved directly. There's no way for Taiwan to, uh, the, the forces on Taiwan to fight off the rest of the Chinese army. Then toward the end of the report, they try to make, a, and I would say a very unconvincing argument that their outcome, their war game and the outcome to their war game is uh, much more realistic than the Pentagon's war games that say there is no chance for the United States to win in a, an arm, a direct armed conflict with China. Uh, I don't see how. The Pentagon has much deeper insight into US military capabilities and also the capabilities of Chinese military systems because of intelligence available to them and only them. Uh, these CSIS experts are political scientists. They don't, they don't have uh, a military background. A lot of them don't, some of them may. I would say that they're trying to make this unconvincing argument because what they're trying to do is say, yes, there is a chance that we can win. And, and if we want to enhance the chances of success, we need to buy more weapons. And so I think this is a really great time to get into uh, the funding behind CSIS. What this really is, is an opportunity to create foreign policy that channels more money into arms manufacturers. So this is their donors, foundations, corporate donors, government donors. Uh, that includes the US government. Let's just look at corporate donors here. And if you look at the top tier, Northrop Grumman Corporation, uh, of course, you have financiers and uh, uh, giant, uh, big oil. But you also have General Atomics. They make. Uh, the drones, Lockheed Martin, we, we've heard all about them. And if you scroll down, you see General Dynamics. They make the M1 Abrams tanks that are being sold to Taiwan as well. Boeing, a big one there. Betchel Corporation, uh, one of these uh, defense contractors. And of course, Raytheon. Uh, down here, you have BAE Systems. And it just goes on and on and on and on a who's who of arms manufacturers across the West, not just in the United States, but across the entire West. Uh, so keep that in mind when you get to the end of this paper and you're reading the recommendations. Uh, recommendations like procure sufficient stockpiles of standoff anti-ship weapons or something like, given the value of submarines, acquiring more is an obvious recommendation. I'm sure that makes BAE and uh, others very happy. Uh, or, Taiwan has ordered billions of dollars of weapons, but deliveries have been slow. The United States should speed up the foreign military sales process on its side and urge the Taiwanese to speed up on their side. There needs to be a sense of urgency. And you know what's interesting is that if you have to tell the Taiwanese to speed it up and remind them that there's a sense of urgency, does that suggest that there really is this big threat? that everyone is aware of this and that this is something that is really uh, at the center of Taiwan's attention? Or is this just as it is with Ukraine, just a proxy war the US is going to 
push the people on Taiwan into against their will. Now, something else to point out is the report admits it's only focusing on a Chinese amphibious landing on the island of Taiwan. Uh, it talks about how alternatively China could just put up a blockade, block air and sea traffic to and from Taiwan. And they could also carry out a extensive barrage, a missile and drone barrage on Taiwan, similar to what uh, Russia is doing with its cruise missiles in Ukraine. They could dismantle a huge amount of military infrastructure doing that and, and leave the island virtually defenseless. They also have uh, images, maps, and, and different types of graphics in this report. And one of them is this map. And this represents one of the maps they used while wargaming. And if you look at South Korea and Japan and Okinawa, and now with the basing agreement signed between the US and the Philippines, the US has its military surrounding uh, from the south to the north, surrounding Taiwan and, and its surrounding areas. And so when we're trying to convince people that China is the aggressor here, when the United States has traveled across the entire Pacific, away from its own shores, to place its military all, all around China, uh, it, it really makes it difficult to portray China as the aggressors. But this is what they're doing anyway. And uh, just to prove that this is about the United States interfering in China's internal political affairs and that it's not China threatening the United States, this is what the CSIS paper says about a potential threat to the U.S. homeland from China. It says, Chinese strikes against the United States because the United States will be striking the Chinese homeland as, as part of this war that they've got all war gamed out. The base case assumes that the U.S. homeland is not a sanctuary. However, the ability of the Chinese to conduct strikes against the U.S. homeland and thereby affect operations in the Western Pacific is extremely limited. A few special forces might infiltrate and attack a small number of high-value targets, but not enough uh, to material materially affect military operations in the Western Pacific. So. Without a doubt, the United States meddling in Taiwan, which they officially recognize as part of China, thousands of miles from their own shores, and antagonizing a nation they themselves admit has no ability to strike them significantly in their own homeland, this is just another example of the United States uh, pushing a war of aggression, another yet yeah, another war of aggression, and while it's doing so, projecting the menace it itself poses to international law, projecting it onto the, the target of their aggression, and in this case, China. Then the paper starts talking about the actual fighting, and they, they talk about uh, the process of detecting enemy units, deploying appropriate weapon systems, and using them to destroy targets, and they talk uh, about a lot of how the fighting is going to take place out at sea, in the air and in, at sea. And they talk about these, these issues that if you're out in a, in a wide open space, like out at sea, how the curvature of the earth limits what, say, a ship's radar can see. It can only, it can only see to a certain extent. And then after that, targets are hiding over the horizon. And so this can mean a ship will only be able to see incoming missiles coming from about as close as 20 kilometers, somewhere around there. That's why you have these uh, aircrafts, these early warning aircraft. They fly up much higher, and so they're able to see further over the horizon with their radars. And whichever side is going to be able to coordinate all of these different units, create a better sense of situational awareness, and, and successfully and efficiently mobilize the right units, the right munitions uh, upon detecting the enemy and, and getting those munitions on target. Whoever's able to consistently do that the best uh, and whoever has the most of these munitions, then they are going to be the ones that come out on top uh, in that type of fighting. And then speaking of that, it talks about Chinese and US military capabilities. It compares them. 
And it, it talks about how, in many cases, Chinese military capabilities are comparable to the United States. And in some ways, China has a definite advantage. Uh, so this is what the paper says. China's A2AD, this is uh, anti-access area denial capabilities, are now formidable. China's sizable and sophisticated force of ballistic and cruise missiles challenges the U.S.'s ability to operate from its few air bases in the Western Pacific. And China's development of anti-ship ballistic missiles threatens to destroy U.S. surface ships. China began launching series production of fourth generation fighter aircraft in the 2000s and now has more than 1,000 such aircraft in service. Service production of large modern warships did not begin until the mid 2010s, but progress since then has been even more striking. Between 2014 and mid 2020, China launched 25 uh, Luyang 3 Type 52D destroyers and eight Renhai cruisers. It is currently building its third aircraft carrier, which at 80,000 tons will be much larger than its first two. And then referring to air to air missiles, which is also going to be extremely important in this type of warfare. It says bouncing the United States' superiority in doctrine and training are the advantages brought by China's long range air to air missiles and geographic advantage. Obviously, when you're picking a fight thousands of miles from your own shores, uh, you are granting the, the nation you are picking on the advantage, the home field advantage, so to speak. The Chinese PL-15 air-to-air -air missile outranges most Air Force advanced medium-range air-to-air missiles, AMRAAM, uh, variants, meaning that the Chinese will often get the first shot in combat beyond visual range. And a lot of, a, a lot in modern warfare is determined by who detects who first and who fires the first sh accurate shot. And that, as you're reading the the scenario as as it unfolds a lot of the u.s uh, achieving victory is the united states wiping out the amphibious landing forces and they they admit to the limitations of u.s military power to uh, say their their war planes to fly anywhere near or over uh, the mainland they talk about u.s submarines and u.s anti-ship missiles doing the, the bulk of taking out these amphibious uh, landing forces, but they admit that a very large number of Chinese soldiers will still reach Taiwan no matter what, what the U.S. does. Uh, but the, the paper concludes that in order for Washington to get a favorable outcome uh, in this fighting, Taiwan must resist. So Taiwan itself has to make the decision that it's, it's going to fight uh, the rest of China. The U.S. needs to intervene and it must intervene immediately. It also needs to be able to use its military bases in places like Japan and, and possibly even the Philippines. If Japan uh, or the Philippines says, no, you cannot use the bases in our country to wage your war with China, then the U.S. has absolutely no other way to project military force into the into the area to achieve this. It also says the U.S. needs to have a huge number of long-range anti-ship missiles. And we already see the problem the U.S. has in terms of military industrial output. Are they capable of doing that? And if not, how long will it take them to become capable of doing that? And is that going to be many years into the future, 2030 perhaps, when the, the gap has already closed and is already widening in China's favor? Uh, another conclusion the paper draws is that uh, China needs to deal with U.S. air power. Uh, that is a deciding factor. The paper admits that China has a thousand fourth generation fighters, it has longer range air to air missiles, it's fighting right off its own coast versus the U.S. Uh, their pilots are going to have to fly ours. Uh, even if they're operating from Japanese or, say, uh, bases in the Philippines, they will be flying for hours before they reach the combat area. Chinese pilots will be fresh, and they'll be right off their own coast. Uh, Chinese pilots will also be able to seek cover amid uh, the integrated air defense system China has. This is how the paper ends. This is literally the last last sentence in the paper. The bottom line from the analysis is that successful defense is possible and deterrence is achievable, but it will require planning, some resources, and political will. And in other words, what they're saying is if you, you know, if you want to beat China, you can, but you need to buy more Raytheon, Lockheed, Boeing, 
BAE, General Dynamics, General Atomics, uh, all to help uh, provoke a war with China <laughs> over an island we officially recognize as Chinese. Now, what can China do to avoid this? The U.S. is obviously determined to provoke yet another war. Uh, it did with Russia through Ukraine. Now it wants to do it with China through Taiwan. What can what can China do? I've pointed out many times before that uh, time is on China's side. Myself and Angelo Giuliano have repeatedly explained how a peaceful and mutually beneficial process of reunification was already well underway. The United States in 2014 sponsored a color revolution similar to what it, it did in Kiev, Ukraine. It did so in Taiwan. The Sunflower Movement by 2016, the U.S. got its client regime into power, the Democratic Progressive Party, this uh, hardliner separatist political faction. And they've tried to roll back a lot of the achievements made in, in terms of peaceful, mutually beneficial reunification. But this is artificial. China's economy, a, as it grows, it is, a, is a magnet for Taiwanese reunification. I want to show you this. It's very important to understand the trade between Taiwan and the rest of China. Uh, exports between China and Hong Kong, if you add them together, and you should because Hong Kong is China, it's about half, half of their exports go to the rest of China. And then in terms of imports, uh, almost a quarter of their imports come from the rest of China. And these imports are, in, uh, are really important inputs for their semiconductor and electrical component industry, which is their largest and most important industry. So that, that in itself, if, the, if China continues investing in that and leveraging that to encourage peaceful and mutually beneficial reunification, I believe that is going to outlast this artificial political project the US is working on through the Democratic Progressive Party. I think China also needs to do everything within its power to avoid US provocations. In this paper, they talk about these marine littoral regiments and how it would be great if they could pre-position <laughs> pre one on Taiwan itself. So having uh, a, a thousand or more US Marines with all of their weapons and missiles on Taiwan itself, a, a tripwire force so that uh, China wouldn't dare do anything toward Taiwan and then the US could openly uh, back, back separatism, uh, so-called independence, actually just carving out a, a, a military base and a, and a colony right off of China's coast. This is, this is their wildest dream. But even if they did that, because of the fact that China continues to grow economically and militarily, and the U.S. continues to fade and exhaust itself, in five to ten years, we still may see a, a scenario where even with the U.S. putting one of these tripwire forces on Taiwan, it could be swept away by China and there would be nothing the United States could do in response. It'll just be a different world where the US is not going to be able to get away with this. Ultimately, China has to avoid war. Asia has to avoid war. Uh, we, we see the Philippines being approached by the United States to place military bases there. Let's look at their trade. Who's their largest trade partner? By far, China. Uh, imports and exports also uh, between China and Hong Kong. Again, a, a huge percentage of their exports go to China. What about Japan? You know, we hear a lot about Japan being, uh, you know, a, a belligerent in a potential U.S. war with China. China is their largest export market. Again, between China and Hong Kong, it is a quarter of their exports go to China. Imports, same story, their largest import uh, partner. What about South Korea? U.S. forces occupy South Korea. Uh, exports, again, their largest export market is China. And their largest import partner is China. So the U.S., just as they did in Europe, They've destabilized and destroyed Europe's economy by, by creating this proxy war with Russia through Ukraine and bringing Europe along uh, on this sanctions war with Russia. They've managed to destroy 
the European economy, Germany especially, the destruction of the Nord Stream pipelines, uh, cutting off cheap energy from Russia to Germany, and they are forever hindering their industrial competitiveness on the global stage. And the same thing is going to happen to Asia. If political leadership is weak in places like Tokyo, Manila, even say here in Bangkok, Thailand, if these nations capitulate to U.S. pressure and they allow the region to become a, a theater for yet another U.S. war of aggression, it's not just going to impact China. It's not. It's going to hurt the entire region. It's going to do to Asia what the U.S. proxy war with Russia through Ukraine has done to Europe. It is going to destroy the economy and it's going to set the region back uh, years if not decades and this is how the u.s plans to maintain its hegemony if it is a fading power it plans on making everyone fade faster uh, if it is sinking lower and lower it's to drop everyone down even faster than it's falling that is their strategy it is this scorched earth approach uh, I think it's in everybody's best interest to look at what is really going on versus what the Western media is telling us is going on, to understand that the U.S. is the belligerent, that it is in everyone's best interest to stop this from happening. It does not mean making an enemy out of the United States. It just means not allowing them to turn yet another region of the planet into a war zone. It's as simple as that. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. Uh, check the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work. Uh, check the video description for all of the links that I referenced in this video, as well as for ways you can help support my work. I don't monetize my YouTube channel. If you see an ad, feel free to skip it because it doesn't help me at all. Uh, if you do want to support my work, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee and also Patreon. And to everyone who has been helping out, thank you so much. I could not do this without that support, whether it's one-time donations, month-to-month -month donations, or even if you're just helping share my work with others, it's all greatly appreciated. Thank you again. And as always, thank you for watching.